In this video, Pastor Chris continues with the message, Desolate Heritages. He dwelt on the scripture in Psalm 74 verses 20 to 21, where it talks about how cruelty and wickedness have taken over in the dark places of the earth. He then goes on to explain our role as Christians and the light of the world in preaching God's love and mercy and bringing salvation to the dark places of the earth. Psalm 74, I want us to read from verse 20. He says, Have respect unto the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Oh, let not the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise thy name. The psalmist here prays to God and says, remember your covenant. What covenant? He's talking about the covenant with God's people. God's covenant with his people. The Abrahamic covenant. He says, have respect to the covenant. For the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. The dark places of the earth. What do you mean by the dark places of the earth? Significantly, he, he, he uses the Hebrew word Eretz, which can be translated earth as you have it, mostly in the King James and the several other translations. It also can be translated word, which will read the dark places of the world are full of the habitations of cruelty. And, uh, could be translated also wilderness, or field, or way, W-A-Y, the dark places of the way, the way in which you go. He says, the dark places of the way are full of the habitations of cruelty. It also can be translated nations. So it'll go, the dark places of the nations are full of the habitations of cruelty. Habitations of cruelty. Have you ever thought about people who are cruel? Have you ever thought about actions of cruelty? Wickedness. When people are desperately wicked. And treat others with such wickedness. Cruelty. Like what happened a few years ago in Sierra Leone. That country was invaded. By demon spirits. And they were so cruel, they cut the limbs of even babies. I remember watching a documentary on, 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 the, on that country, and um, some of them testified of what happened. They said these soldiers would come in. Some of them were boy soldiers, little boys, 10 years old, 12 years old, that were doing this havoc. And uh, they would say, do you choose long sleeve or short sleeve? Meaning, do we cut you from the wrist or cut you from above your elbow? And then the one will, will say long sleeve or he will say short, short sleeve. And they will actually cut the hair. And they maim so many of them. Darkness, gross darkness, had covered Sierra Leone. This is the dark places of the earth, are full of the habitations. Habitations. That word means home. It means a resting place, a pleasant place. Uh, that's another way of telling us the dark places of the earth are saturated. With wickedness, cruelty. Cruelty has made a home. Cruelty has found a resting place. Wickedness has found a pleasant place. In other words, a place that's available for its operation in full manifestation. Why should that be? The dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. 
That scripture has been in my mind since 1980. I prayed with it. I thought through it. I've been inspired by it. To think of what must I do? I can't just be quiet. The psalmist prayed to God and said, Have respect unto the covenant. For the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Satan's den. Then, so passionately, he prays in the 21st verse. You can see it there. He said, oh, let not the oppressed return ashamed. I'll never forget so many times that I prayed with that verse, prayed with that scripture, this portion of the Bible you're reading. And I will cry and cry and use those words. Oh God, let not the oppressed return ashamed. Those seeking help from God. Oh God, don't let them return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise your name. In other words, let them have testimonies. Let them have something to shout about. But then I found out very quickly also. That it was not a helpless situation that we found ourselves, but a place of opportunity. He says, the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. To me, as I studied that portion, God was talking to me. God was letting me know what was happening in places of darkness. Full of the habitations of cruelty. Where are the dark places of the earth? Where are the dark places of the world? These are places that are not dominated by the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are the places where they haven't received the light of God. These are places that are ruled by the, the, the children of darkness and the principalities of evil. Places that we have neglected. Places that we have not been concerned about. Because in, in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, and verse 14, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. So we are the light of the world. So if we arrived, if we came, darkness will be nowhere. Darkness will be gone. So, what was God's answer to the cries coming from the dark regions? It was us. First he sent Jesus, the Bible says in Psalm 107, when you read from the 20th verse. Actually, if you begin reading it from the 17th verse, it tells you fools for their iniquities and for their transgressions are afflicted. It says their, their, their soul abhorred all manner of fools. They draw nigh to the gates of death. And then in their trouble, in their distress, they cry unto God. And He hears them. In that 20th verse it says, He sent His word. And healed them. And delivered them from their destruction. He sent His word. Mary doesn't say He did anything. He says He sent His word. God's answer is His word. But His word came as the living word. Jesus Christ, the living word. When he came, the solution was packaged in a human being. Jesus Christ. Jesus came as a human being. The Bible calls him the man, Christ Jesus. So God's answer was packaged in a man, Jesus Christ. He came as God's answer. No wonder the Bible says he was in the world. The world was made by him. The world knew him not. He came unto his own. His own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power, the authority, to become the sons of God. Hallelujah. So Jesus Christ came to save them. But Jesus was cut off 
at the age of 33. Even though he is the eternal God. Amen. But he came in a human body. And at age 33 was slain. The Bible says Messiah was cut off. So his work ended in the earth. He died and was buried. And God raised him up, but he ascended and went to heaven. But then the Bible says, when you study in Isaiah chapter 53, it says, He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. In other words, glory to God. See, we are the seed of Jesus Christ. We are his reproduction. He says, he shall see his seed. And through his seed, he shall prolong his days. So even though at age 33, he was cut off, his work, his life has continued through you, through me. So he gave us his name to function with. He gave us his life to live. He gave us his word to live by. Hallelujah. So, God's answer came and went to heaven, but continued in me. So what? I am God's answer. Jesus came and said, I am the light of the world. Whosoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Then he said, you are the light of the world. Hallelujah. Yes, we are the light of the world. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, he calls us light. Yes, we are the light. So, when he cries, the, the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. That means I can do something. I'm supposed to do something about it. I can't just be quiet. He says, let not the oppressed return ashamed. And that's a prayer of the Spirit. Let the poor and needy praise thy name. So what can we do? You are either a victor or you are a victim. There's no middle ground. I say it again. You are either a victor or you are a victim. Or are you? You are either in the place of darkness, suffering. In the place of darkness. That's in a dark place. Or you're taking light to the dark places of the earth. You are either in need of salvation. Or you're taking salvation to the ends of the earth. There's no middle ground. What is your responsibility? What is your job? You are the light of the world. You've been told. The dark places of the earth. The dark places of the nations. The dark places of the way. The dark places of politics. The dark places of business. Aren't you aware in politics? The kill, there's cruelty, there's wickedness. In business, that's the same. In government, there's cruelty, there's wickedness. In families, there's wickedness. This is the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Because they have no light. They don't have the light of God. They don't have the light of the gospel. It's only the gospel that changes men's lives. The gospel gives you a new way of thinking. 
Hallelujah. New thoughts. New ideas. New ways of doing things. The gospel of Jesus Christ. When you receive that light into your spirit, because the word of God is light. When that light dawns on your spirit, you think differently. The wickedness is gone. The love of God is shed abroad on our hearts, according to the Bible, by the Holy Ghost. You're full of love. The light has come. The darkness is gone. And when we take the gospel to others, the same thing happens with them. But if we are quiet, then Satan has a field day. Then Satan runs rampage with men's lives. Hallelujah. Are you thinking what you're going to do? Say, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. You know, sometimes I think about certain people. That sometimes when I hear some people talk or look at the way, you know, some people are, then I say, oh, I wish I met them early. Sometimes I think like that. I, I wish I met them early enough. Their lives wouldn't be like this. Because I know I'm in possession of something that can change anybody. And lift them from a low level of life to a high level of life. Become confident of what God has put inside you. When you study the, the epistles, Paul would say, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Or an apostle of Jesus Christ. He knew who he was. He said, I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my office. There's a lot of people who don't know how to magnify their office. They're waiting for somebody to think big about them. And nobody's going to think big about you. You are the one to think big about what God's given to you to do. Respect the calling of God in your life. Don't expect someone else to do that. You're the one to do it. You're the one to think big about what God has done in your life. Some people say, I'm just a pastor. Another one says, oh God, thank you, I'm a pastor. Another one says, I'm just, I'm just a deacon. Another one says, thank God, I'm a deacon. You see what I mean? I'm just a missionary. I'm a missionary with a purpose. See what I mean? So, there's a difference in the way we, we think about what God has called us. Somebody said, well, you know, we are Christians. We are seen as saved by grace. No. Another one says, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. One says, I'm redeemed. The other one says, no, I'm the fruit of redemption. <laughs> Hallelujah. You understand what I'm talking about? So, the, our mentality cannot be the same with those who don't have the kind of thoughts that the, the Word of God gives to us. So, sometimes they look at you and they think you're braggadocious. And you're not. You're just being real. When they asked Jesus, Are you a king? He didn't say, They said, I am so... <laughs> He said, to this end was I born. Right? Yeah. Are you the son of God? He said, yes. He said, yes. The Jews said, you, being a man, for making yourself, God, they pick up, picked up stones. They said, they're going to kill him. That he's a man. How could, you, how could you make yourself equal to God? He didn't say, I didn't say so, I didn't say so. <laughs> he didn't talk like that. He said, look at you. He said, didn't you read 
what was said in the law? I have said ye are gods. And all of your children of the Most High. He said if he, if he called them gods. Unto whom the word of God came. How can you say to the one that God has sanctified. That he is blasphemous. Hallelujah. I remember reading one time a, a certain minister of the gospel was apologizing for ever daring to say that we are gods. Because some of the Christians got a hold of him and they said, you know, this preaching that you've gotten into, that's getting into your head, this little God syndrome, you think you're somebody. Give all the glory to God. How do you give glory to God? They think when you say, I was not involved. It was God. You think that's the way to give glory to God? Not what Jesus did. You give glory to God by doing what He called you to do. Right? Not by saying, I just give God glory. How? Where is it? It's like saying, I've given God the offering. (laughs) Where is it? Oh God, I just give you the offering. I give you the offering. Have you ever done that? Oh God, I give you the offering. No, you give it. Even if you didn't say anything. Father, thank you. And, and you offer it. Huh? The Lord can see it. Where is the offering? I give you the offering. Where is the offering? No, no, I give you the glory. Where is the glory? Where is the glory? The glory is shown. You know, Jesus, Jesus said something beautiful. He said, let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. In other words, as they look at your life, you know, people say, oh, God is wonderful. Hey, God is wonderful. That is how to bring glory to God. <laughs> Amen. You know, people listen to your words and say, praise the Lord. They watch you and say, praise the Lord. That's how to bring glory to God. Not by saying, oh God, I just glorify you. Oh, I just give you glory. Where is it? God is here, where is the glory? Bring it, where is it? Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God forevermore. Okay, so, did you get the thought? He said, the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Then... There's another thing that we have to understand. Maybe I should read a scripture that gives you the idea of what I'm talking about now. Isaiah chapter 50. The book of Isaiah chapter 50. Hallelujah. I got the life of God in me. Isaiah chapter 50, I want you to read verse 10. Read it out to me. One, two, go. Did you? Uh, read it again. Read it again. serious. Very, very serious. Thank you. He's telling you something. Very serious. He says, Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? He says, Hey, who is that person that's living a life of contradiction? He says, who is it that fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? That means you believe in God. You, you are, you, you listen to the word and you act accordingly. And yet, you have no light. And you're walking in darkness. 
Have you found yourself in that situation? Have you found yourself where you thought, I mean, you're serving God. You're doing everything that is all right. You're doing the right thing. You look at your life. It's not like maybe something's gone wrong and you wonder, but why isn't the light in my life? Some say, oh God, where are my testimonies? Oh God, look what I'm going through. I'm a child of God. This is not supposed to be happening to me. But why is it happening? He says, Who is among you that feareth the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant and hath no light walking in darkness? He says, Is there somebody that's going through that? What did he say you should do? He says, What? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. He says, let him trust in the name of the Lord. Thank you. And stay, stay upon his God. Why? How will you stay upon your God? Things aren't going right. It looks like you're walking in darkness. You have found yourself in the dark places of the earth. Like we said, Eretz, the dark places of the way, are full of the habitations of cruelty. He says, maintain your composure. Stay upon your God. Don't run backwards. You know some people, after they become Christians, and they think everything ought to go fine, but things go worse. Then they say, I thought when you become a Christian, everything would be alright. And so, they give up and withdraw. No. Stay. Stay. How do you handle situations of that nature? How? You want to know? Sure, you want to know? I've told you before. It's true. All right, let me show you something from the Bible that will be beneficial to you. Um, Second Peter, chapter number one. Have you found it? I will read to you. Oh, glory to God. Ah. Who, who? Hey, hey. Listen to this. You know, I, I, just to read this, um, I'm stared on the inside. Okay, I, I'll read to you from verse 16 so you can get the context. For we have not followed, have you seen that? Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we are witnesses of his majesty. Listen, this is the apostle Peter. This is Peter writing and he tells his readers, He says to them, we haven't been deceived. We haven't followed mere stories. We haven't followed cunningly devised fables when we told you about Jesus and his glory. He says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were there. We saw with our eyes. We experienced these things with him. We were with him three long years. Now, listen to the way he presents his message to them. So we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Verse 17. For He, talking about Jesus, for He received from God the Father honor and glory. He's talking about Jesus. He's telling His readers about Jesus. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Are you listening to this? Peter says, I was there. I heard a voice. 
speak from out of heaven. He said, we beheld his excellent glory. You remember Peter was there at the transfiguration? He was there when a voice spoke from out of heaven. Talking about Jesus, said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now Peter tells his readers, I was there. He says, look, we were witnesses. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. He says, and this voice, verse 18, and this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We heard this voice. This voice that spoke to Jesus from heaven. He says, we, we heard when we were with him. At that mount of transfiguration. So we saw his excellent glory. You remember how the Bible tells us that his, 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 his clothes became so bright, as white as snow, with so much light of glory. And Peter said, Master, let us build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Because they saw those two men with Jesus. And a cloud of glory covered them. Now Peter tells them, we were with him. We saw. We heard. Hmm. Now, strikingly, in verse 19, I said strikingly. I want you to read verse 19. Stop there. Stop. Stop. He said, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. He's saying there is something that is more trustworthy than our experience. Even though I heard that voice from out of heaven, even though I saw the excellent glory, he says, there is a more sure word of prophecy. It is not what we heard with this ear that's important. It's not what we saw with these eyes that's important. He says there's a more sure word of prophecy. The word is more sure than our experience. Hallelujah. Oh, glory, 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 hallelujah. The word is more sure. It is that you do well to take heed unto it. As what? As unto a light that shines in a dark place. Oh. Whew. Do you know what he's talking about? When life looks dark and things seem difficult, he says, take hold of the most sure word of prophecy like you would do when you're in a dark place and there's a flicker of light. What do you do? You follow that light. Because everywhere is dark. He says, take heed unto it as unto a light in a dark place. Have you found yourself in a dark place? When there's a darkness about your job, when there's a darkness about your finances, it looks like you don't know what the answer is. I've given my seeds. I mean, I gave my offerings. I gave my tithes. I gave my first fruits. Now I don't understand what's going on. And things seem to get worse. He says there's a more sure word of prophecy. He says, you do well to take heed on to it. You do well to take heed on to it. He says, take a hold of it. As unto a light that shines in a dark place. Ah! I 
don't know whether... Well, are you getting this stuff? Maybe you should read that whole verse, verse 19. I've got some more stuff for you right in there. Come on. Read again, verse 19. Remember, Peter is writing to Christians. He's not writing to sinners. He's not writing to sinners. You check the first chapter, his introduction, you understand he's writing to Christians, not to sinners. Now he says, you do well to take heed unto it. As unto a flicker of light in a dark place. When you're in a thick, in a room with thick darkness, or in space of darkness, and then you see light somewhere, he says, hey, you go after that light. You can't see nothing else but that light. He says, you do well to take heed unto that more sure word of prophecy. What does he mean by a more sure word of prophecy? You'll know in a moment. So, he says, you do well to take heed unto it. So, he says, hang on to that light until the day dawn. And notice, notice where he says the day dawns. He says, until the day dawns and the day star arise in your hearts. That means he's not talking about what we see on the outside. He says, until the day dawns in your hearts. So, I don't know about this thing. I, I, maybe, maybe some kind of fear is trying to greet me. Unbelief is trying to attack me. And I, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? He says, the scripture you know about this situation. He says, hold on to it. He says, you may not feel like it's working out, but hold on to it. Things may not be changing on the outside, but hold on to it. You see it? You keep quoting that word to yourself, to God and to the situation. You hold on to it. As you would do to a light in a dark place. He says, until the day dawn. In other words, until in your spirit it lights up. And you know that you know that you know it's a dawn here. You come to that point, he says, until the day dawns and the day star arise in your heart. So in your spirit, you have received the light. You know it. Things may not have changed on the outside yet, but you just know that you know. You know. As long as there is a doubt, he says, hold on to that sure word. Your heart may try to go this way and that way. He says, hold on to that sure word. He says, it's a more sure word than our experiences. Hold on to it. He says, if you keep on holding on, soon enough, the light will beam in your spirit. And then you begin to say, I know, I have it. I know. I know. I remember years ago. You know, years ago, I, I was, you know, getting stared along these lines. And I was listening to Young Cho tell a story. He was in need of a certain amount of money. And he, he said he needed that money, uh, a large amount of money. I believe he said he, he, he needed about $500,000 at the time. And at that time, it was a lot of money, years ago. And he needed to pay for airtime, television time. He was behind and needed this money. And he had been praying and declaring. He had talked about it. But he, he, the money just didn't come. So, but he kept speaking the word and, and, and expecting a miracle. Then one day, at the breakfast table, when the table was set, and he was invited to come and have his breakfast, he sat down to eat, and suddenly he shouted, I got it! I got it! I got it! 
His wife came and said, what's the matter? What's the matter? He said, I've got it. I've got it. I... Okay, you've got it. Please sit down. What's the matter? She thought something had gone wrong with his head. Please sit down. Okay, you've got it. What is it you've got? He said, I've got it. 500,000. I've got it. Oh, 500,000? You don't have 500,000. Oh, I've got it. It had dawned on his spirit. He had been holding on to the word, the sure word of prophecy. He that asketh receiveth. He had held on to it. Until suddenly, instead of thinking, when is it coming? When is it coming? Oh God, I really need that money. Uh uh-uh. uh. As he held on to the word, suddenly the day dawned on his spirit. Like Peter says, until the day star arise in your heart. That consciousness comes, you just know. You just know. Guess what, a few days later, somebody called his office. He was not in the country. This happened in the U.S., he was back in Korea. And somebody called his office in the U.S. and said, uh, uh, May I speak to Dr. Cho? Oh, they said, no, he's not available. He said, well, I was watching the program last night. And the Lord spoke to me to send him $500,000. I just want to know how to send the money. And he was given the details and wired the money in. And they called up to Cho. You got your five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Where somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> we have a more sure word of prophecy. <laughs> hallelujah. What did Peter refer to as the more sure word of prophecy? When you read the next verse, you'd see it. He's talking about the scriptures. He said, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He said, no scripture is of any private interpretation. So he's dealing with scripture when he says the most sure word of prophecy. He's talking about scripture. So the scriptures are solace. Are you hearing me? It is the most sure word. It is settled. It is complete already. And God has said, I watch over my word to perform it. Thou hast exalted thy word above all thy name. The more sure word. Hallelujah. There's a more sure word. Tell somebody there's a more sure word. Doesn't matter what you heard from the doctor, there's a more sure word. Doesn't matter what you read on The Economist, there's a more sure word. Are you listening to me? There's a more sure word, the word of God. Woo! Mine, oh mine. The more sure word. can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. There's a more sure word. No weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. There's a more sure word. Hallelujah, 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 glory to God, hallelujah. Oh, Shandana Bahaya, hallelujah, glory to God. Magnify God. Go ahead and worship and magnify God. If you have been blessed by this message, like and share it so others can be blessed as well. 
Be sure to subscribe to our channel in order to support our ministry of helping to get the gospel out to the peoples of the world in these last days of these end times.